Now we turn to another field, Galois field two, which has just two elements, zero and one. It's named after Galois, who was a remarkable mathematician who laid the foundation for group theory, but died in a duel at the age of 21. Addition of zero and one in the Galois field two is just like exclusive or. That is, adding one and one gives you zero. Multiplication is just like ordinary multiplication of zero and one. And the usual algebraic laws hold. For example, multiplication distributes over addition. And we'll provide a simple module called GF2 that defines a value one. This value acts like the one in GF2. So, and we'll use one when, we're, when we write programs that operate on GF2 values. Here's an application of GF2 to cryptography. Now suppose Alice wants to communicate with Bob. She only wants to communicate one bit, let's say. It's called P, the plain text. So they use a, a crypto system to ensure privacy. Now here's the table describing the crypto system. Alice and Bob agree beforehand on a secret key, K. And Alice will encrypt her plain text P by using this table to figure out the ciphertext C that she should transmit to Bob. By studying that encryption table, you might notice that it's really just a, the addition table for GF2. We can therefore implement encryption like this. Here's how we would use it. Import the one from GF2. Let's say the key is one and the plain text is one. We compute the ciphertext using encryption. And that's what we get. Now once Bob receives that ciphertext, can he figure out what the plain text is. Well, he knows K, the key. He receives uh, 0 and 1 as the ciphertext. Now, for any particular value of K and any particular value of C, there's only one value of plain text correspond that's consistent with those. So Bob can determine what plain text was intended by Alex. Now, suppose an eavesdropper, Eve, observes the value of C. She doesn't know the secret key. Can she learn anything about the plain text? Well, here's the simple answer, no, and here's why. Suppose that uh, the ciphertext is zero. Remember, Eve doesn't know the key. She can look at this table and say, oh, the ciphertext is zero, so maybe the plain text is zero. That's the case if the key is zero. Or maybe the plain text is one, if the key is one. Since she doesn't know whether the key is zero is, or one, she can't figure out whether the plain text is zero or one. And here's a somewhat more sophisticated answer. It depends on how the secret key is chosen. So let's suppose the secret key is chosen by flipping a coin. So the probability is one half that the key is zero and one half that the key is one. Let's look at it from Eve's perspective. Before she even goes out to eavesdrop, she reasons as follows. Suppose the plain text turns out to be zero. Well, the key is chosen randomly. So looking at the first two rows of the table, the probability that the corresponding ciphertext is zero is one half, and the probability that the ciphertext is one is one half. Now suppose that the plain text was actually one. Looking at the last two rows of the table, the key is chosen randomly. So the probability that the ciphertext is one is one half. And the probability that the ciphertext is zero is one half. So the choice of the value p, the plain text, is not reflected in the probability distribution of the ciphertext. Eve doesn't learn anything from observing C. She might as well just stay home and flip a coin because the ciphertext is just 
zero with probability one half, and one with probability one half. What is it about this crypto system that leads to perfect secrecy? Why does Eve learn nothing from eavesdropping? Well, let's define the function f0 as follows. f0 takes as input the key, k, and outputs the encryption of the plain text 0 with that key. So according to the first two rows of this table, f0 of 0 equals 0, and f0 of 1 equals 1. This function is 1 to 1 and on to. Now, when the key k is chosen randomly according to the uniform distribution, that is, uh, when, when k is 0 with probability 1 half and 1 with probability 1 half, then the probability distribution of the output is also uniform. That is, the probability that the uh, ciphertext is 0 is 1 half, and the probability that the ciphertext is 1 is also 1 half. Now let's turn to the function f1. f1 is the encryption of the plain text 1 with the key k. Now, according to the last two rows of this table, f1 of 0 equals 1, and f1 of 1 equals 0. So this function is also 1 to 1 and on to. And so when the key is chosen uniformly at random, the probability distribution of the output is also uniform. That is, the probability that the ciphertext is 1 is 1 half, and the probability that the ciphertext is 0 is also 1 half. So it seems, regardless of what the plain text is, the probability distribution of the ciphertext is uniform. One half probability of zero and one half probabi probability of one. So the probability distribution of the ciphertext doesn't depend on the plain text when the key is chosen randomly. From E's perspective, there's no point in observing the ciphertext. She knows it's just going to be uh, a, a, a bit, either zero or one, chosen according to the uniform distribution. She might as well stay home and flip a coin. This is the idea for the crypto system called the one-time pad. If each bit is encrypted according to this table with its own one-bit key, this crypto system is unbreakable. No eavesdropper can learn anything. Now, in the 1940s, the Soviets uh, seemed to have run out of key, and they started reusing bits that they had used from previous messages. And this was discovered by the US Army's Signal Intelligence Corps Service. They started slowly finding places where they could decrypt little bits of the message. This led to some very important intelligence, uh, in including uh, information about the Soviet espionage uh, on uh, nuclear weapons. And we only learned about this in 1995 when, uh, uh, when information on this project, the, the Venona project, was declassified. Here's another application of GF2. Imagine you need to stream video through a network starting at this point. Now, if there's only one recipient of, of the video stream, since there are two paths that share no edges, the video can be pumped at two bits per unit time from this point to this point, one bit through each of these paths. But now suppose that there are two recipients of the video stream. Well, one bit is being sent this way, one bit is being sent this way, but there's contention on this link. So you can't directly stream two bits per unit time through this network to both receivers. Instead, we require the network itself to do a tiny bit of computation. So at this point in the network, the two bits of the stream are added together using the addition rule for GF2. Now at this point, this recipient gets the bit B1 and the bit B1 plus B2. This recipient can uh, obtain B2 by subtracting B1 from the sum. 
this recipient gets the bit B2 and the bit B1 plus B2. So can obtain the bit B1 by subtracting. So you see, in this case, you can effectively double the throughput from this source to these two recipients using GF2 addition.